This is Norm from Tested.com. I'm here at the DARPA Robotics Challenge Finals. Teams, 24 teams from all over the country, all over the world, have come and brought their robots and their teams to tr tackle this challenge. I'm here with Doug Steven. You're of IHMC, Team IHMC. This is the Florida Institute of Human Machine Cognition. That is correct. Yeah, we are from the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. We're a nonprofit research institute out of Pensacola, Florida. And what I'd love to learn from you and your team is how you've taken advantage of this robot platform. This robot uh, you guys have worked on is based on the Atlas platform developed by Boston Dynamics. Kind of the, the next, the newest one, the Atlas Unplugged version. Um, now for people out there who don't know anything about the Atlas robot, what are its features? How does it sense the world? How does it interact with the world? So the robot by itself, it's a bipedal, hydraulically powered robot, except for the forearms. There are three degrees of freedom in the forearm that are electric. It's, it's sensing is mostly just joint sensing, you know, sensing the, the state of the hydraulics, pressure, flow, things like that. And then it has an IMU, which is an accelerometer and a gyroscope for uh, sensing its, you know, orientation in the world. Um, for doing actual perception, they rely on a lot of third-party stuff. So the head is a commercial product, it's called the Multisense SL from a company for, uh, called Carnegie Robotics. And it's a combination of passive stereo camera with a laser rangefinder, or LiDAR, which is basically the same principle as radar, it uses a reflected source, but in this case it's a laser, it's a light instead of sound. So between the stereo camera, which can do you know, a little bit of texture and depth because it's binocular vision, plus the LiDAR, you get a camera feed of the world in addition to building up a 3D map of the world. So what we do is we combine the IMU, the, the state estimation or orientation estimation, with the point cloud and the camera sensing to basically build a map of the world and then situate the robot in the map of the world. And we provide that information to our human operator. Awesome, so like an autonomous car, for example, which has the LiDAR sensors above it, it can sense the world, it has a point cloud, data, all this data, also with some depth map being, what do you do with that data to tell the robot how to control its limbs and control its arms? So for us, we actually don't rely on a lot of computer vision or perception-based autonomy. Um, we lean heavily on our human operator to make high-level decisions. The uh, sort of the extent of the autonomy on the robot is the, the walking and balancing algorithm. Um, the robotics group at IHMC is a small part of IHMC, and in the robotics group, we've always sort of focused on, on walking and balancing algorithms, legged robots, bipedal robots. That's been our bread and butter for, for over a decade now. So the, the autonomy on the robot is mostly in the whole body control. It's, you know, given a particular configuration and external forces in the world acting on the robot, how do you maintain your balance and keep from falling over? Um, from there, all of the high level of perception and sensor information, that actually goes straight into our user interface and it's presented to our operator. Um, part of our design philosophy is something we call coactive design, which is a system design approach where we, we always uh, treat the human factor and the human operator component as part of the whole system. So when we are developing the software that consumes the sensor information and turns it into data, or when we are developing the API for the whole body control algorithm, the human operator is always a consideration instead of an afterthought. And we use that to inform GUI design, we use that to inform data displays, we use that to make it easy for the operator to intuitively and quickly and flexibly interact with the robot. You said some of your team's expertise is in that bipedal platform and balance, because these robots, it, we take walking and standing, even standing, for granted, and that's something that's difficult even for a complex robot. When the robot's in just even a fixed state, what is going on to keep it standing up? When it's walking, when it's getting out of the vehicle, what's going on there? There are a lot of different ways to approach that problem, and, and like you said, it is something we take for granted, right? Because it happens, you know, sort of, sort of subconsciously for us, right? We just do it. We don't really think about how we walk in balance. Robots is completely different. You have to formalize it, you have to figure out the math, you have to figure out how to turn that into software that the robot understands. The approach we take, it's sort of at the really, really low level. Um, a lot of people do what's called position control on a robot, which is where you just try and get the joint to go to a specific position. We do what's called torque control, which is where we actually, you know, a couple of steps removed, we're doing control over the effort the joints are exerting, and we use that to get it to the position that it wants to. The nice thing about that is that you sort of get a lot of the stuff inherently required for balancing for free. You can sort of respond to external forces for free because if something bumps into you and you're not meeting your control goals, that shows up as you not achieving the forces that you're trying to achieve. So that's sort of the core of the algorithm is to do force control. At a higher level, we do a, a sort of whole body control where we take into consideration all of the points the robot has in contact with the world so we can even use, you know, push on walls for control if we have to. So we look at the feet, we look at where the hands are, look at what we're in contact with, we look at all the efforts we're exerting at all the different joints, the entire configuration of the robot, and from there we can, you know, look at look at some simpler constructs such as, you know, the center of mass where that projects onto the ground. You know, is that basically in a box drawn by the feet? Center of pressure of the feet. 
Um, and then also something that we call an instantaneous capture point or, or captureability, which is a measure of how stable you are. It can tell you if you're in danger of falling down. And so between those three things, we can, we can figure out a stability metric and then control the, the forces at the joints to make sure that we stay inside that stability metric. Now you also talk about the way you think about you, the team controlling the robots. One organism, there's an operator, it's getting all the data with the GUIs that you've developed. Um, what does the team see and what type of control do you send the robot for this specific challenge? So for this challenge, the, the user interface is basically, a, it's almost like a video game. It's sort of a split screen view. On the left side, you have a first person view based on the stereo cameras. And on the right side, you have a, a laser, like a 3D map of the world from the laser rangefinder that's built out of a combination of the robot's state estimation with the LiDAR point cloud that we get back. And then from there, we send fairly high level commands to the robot. We can say, you know, walk over here, put your foot there, put your hand here, open your hand, close your hand, things like that. So the, the commands that we send are fairly high level. And then when something unexpected happens, if you know, the robot is having trouble with something, you know, what if you optimize your software and your algorithms for this particular challenge? Are there certain challenges that you know you're comfortable tackling? What are the more difficult ones? Uh, so the software itself, I wouldn't really say it's been optimized for the DRC. It is very general purpose software. In fact, um, we've taken the same algorithms that are running on Atlas and we've run them on at least two other humanoid robots before. And it works very well. And that's, that's sort of been the goal from the beginning is to develop a general algorithm for humanoid robots. Um, in regards to the DRC, the tasks that we feel best about are the locomotion tasks. Like I said before, we do focus on walking and balancing algorithms. So that's you know the, the terrain and things like that. Um, that being said, we did fall on the terrain yesterday, which is a bit of a bummer for us, but we did some analysis after the fact and it ended up being operator error, not a failure of the algorithm. So. Um, there's always things that can go wrong, uh, especially when you do have a, a human in the loop, right? But we do still feel that uh, high-level decision-making processes are much better handled by human beings than they are by autonomous or, or artificial sort of machine learning algorithms, at least at this point with the state of the art. And then looking forward beyond the DRC, you know, the, all the research you and your team have done, how far away are we from robots that don't act like one-year-olds or maybe two-year-olds? I think there'll be like, uh, like commercial applications, practical applications for humanoids um, in my lifetime. Uh, it's still probably a good bit away, like it's still probably a couple of decades out, but I do think we're approaching it pretty quickly. Um, we're going to have to overcome more than just you know, software and, and mechanics. There's you know, batteries and power density and all those problems you have to solve for these things to be really practical. But I do think we're getting there really quickly. And I think uh, if you compare just you know, in the year and a half from the trials to the finals, look at how much faster some of these robots have gotten, I think that, that proves it right there. right? Like We really are advancing the state of the art in robotics pretty quickly, but we're not quite there yet. Awesome, thank you so much, Doug, for yeah, chatting no with us, and good luck to your team. Thank you very much.